It's the song of the redeemed Rising from the African plain It's the song of the forgiven Drowning out the Amazon rain Song of Asian believers Filled with God's holy fire it's every tribe, every song, every nation A love song born of a great folk choir All God's children sing in glory, glory Above the four winds, caught up in the here and the sound. The praises echo from the towers of cathedral to the faithful gathered on the ground. All the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to persist. All the bells rung from a thousand steeples, none rings truer than this. All the children sing in glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. So all the children sing in glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. All the power. Of darkness tremble at what they've just heard. So all the power, all the powers of darkness can't drown out a single song of children singing. so much you guys bless your heart and the guys worked on the coolers man Woo! Yeah. feeling right today right why don't you stand with us this morning and let's sing one together while well, folks are still coming here we go the lord's our rock in him we hide shelter in the time of storm secure what Tide, shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is rocking a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Jesus is rocking a weary land. He's a shelter in the time of storm. Sea by day, defense by during the time of storm, no fears of law, no foes of fright, shelter in the time. Sing that last one. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear, shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper, ever near, shelter in the time of storm. Shelter in the time of the 
stone. Chris, did I, I left out a verse, didn't I? Well, I better sing it. Thanks, man. The raging storms may round us beat. Shelter in the time of storm. We will never leave our safe retreat. Shelter in the time of storm. Are sounding good. Help us with another one. Probably catching my bald area. <laughs> Try this one with us this morning, guys. I can see the clouds roll in. I can feel the wind as it dry. seat if you'd like. You know, we come in and we work on them on Saturday. We kind of get ready for today. Man, it just, 
It's better when we're together. All of this is way good. Lots to thank the Lord for today, huh? Amen. This song says so much. Help comes from the Lord lifting our eyes to him today. Try this together with us. Our help comes from the Lord. He could rule heaven and earth. Oh, we find all our hope in Him. He's the keeper of our hearts, lover of every soul. come to this place. God, thank you for our church family today, the fellowship that we find here today. Lord, the, the love that we know and we sense as we walk through the door, just a reflection of the love that you've loved us with. Lord, we give you today, thanking you once again that you are the, the rock that we can stand on. Thanking you, Lord, that you are our shelter in the time of storm. Thanking you this morning, Lord, that everything that we do in this coming week, Lord, it can be Again, a, a reflection of you in our community. Lord, we, we pray that you just lead us, guide us, direct us, take us to those places you need us this week to share the love that we have found in you. And God, we give you all the thanks, all the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Maybe just one more together before Pastor comes this morning. Love this song, and uh, I got a friend who loves this too. He's not here with us this morning. But uh, we're going to sing it anyway. Miss him here today. Usually sits about row number three, right? Bro Millard. Love the words to this one. It goes like this. All of you is more than enough for all of me. For every thirst and every need you satisfy. 
me with your love All I have in you is more than enough You are my supply, my breath of life Still more awesome than I know Still more awesome than I know But all of you is more than enough for All of me for every thirst and every need You satisfy me with your love All I have in you is more than enough You're my sad Sacrifice of greatest price, still more awesome than I know. You're my coming king, my everything, still more awesome than I know. And all of you is more than enough for all of me. For every thirst and every need, you satisfy. Going down the steps with flair, huh? We're going to get the letters to the churches in the Revelation. And again, I would point out from my perspective, the book is much more about the revelation of a person than it is about events and stuff. When you reveal the person of who Christ is, you get the events with it, Okay. If he's the Alpha and the Omega and everything in between, then all of history, all events, all revolve around him one way or another. This church is interesting today that we're going to look at because Jesus is presented, and that's what we're looking at. We're not looking at the whole letter. We're looking primarily at the characteristic, who is Christ? How does he present himself to this particular church? This particular church, the church at Philadelphia, is a church that is known for brotherly love. That's the name of the, that's what the, the name means. These are people who are actually, have found the love of Christ in their life, and they share it not only with their Lord, but they share it with each other and out into the community. And so this is very interesting, this particular letter, because he has really nothing bad to say about it. He just simply says, here's what's going on, and here's what's going to take place, and here's what I'm going to do. So he presents himself as the holy and the true God. 
He has the key of David in his hand. We're going to discuss what that means here in the moments ahead. So let's look at Revelation 3.7. You should have it on your sheet there. It's two pages today because I wanted you to have the verses in context. Go back and, and study through it on your own. Get the, the, the broader context is always important. We also have pointed out one more time, if you haven't heard this, the angel is not a heavenly angel. The angels are the leaders, the pastors of the church. That's why God either basically condemns them, condemns them for what's missing, or he says, here's what you're doing right. You don't do that for heavenly angels. We're not talking about heavenly angels. We're talking about the leadership. The word angel means messenger. These are the messengers of the seven churches who have the message of the gospel. How are you doing with that message? That's the issue in those seven letters. And God has the corrective for it if it's needed. He has a promise to go with it. He always presents himself first. Another thing that I think is important in understanding these letters is, in my view, it is not historical sequence at all. If it were, and we are the church of Laodicea, then the previous six don't matter because they're done and gone. I don't think that's accurate at all. That all of the letters to all of the churches represent the universal body of Christ, all believers through all time. Therefore, Jesus, as he presents himself to one church, to two, to three, to four, to all seven, all of those identifiers still, still apply to him today. All of the good things that are there, if the shoe fits, wear it. If there needs to be a corrective, again, if the shoe fits, wear it. Listen and hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So let's look at Revelation 3, 7. We'll start there, and then we'll try to... Uh, Take this description of Christ and break it down, okay? And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Let's start with the first part. Jesus is presented as the one that is holy and true. There is no other holy one. There is no other true one. He alone is the holy one of God. He alone is the truth of God. He himself is true God. Ezekiel 39, 7 says this, So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord the Holy One of Israel. Folks, we are not holy in and of ourselves ever, ever, ever. We are made holy by the holiness of God, by coming to the blood of Christ on the cross of Calvary. We are declared holy because the Holy One has made us holy. In position, okay? We know we're still sinners. We don't, we don't dispute that at all. In God's sight, we are holy and righteous. So he says, I'm going to make my name known, and I am the holy God. I'm not the God of your own making. I'm not the God you want me to be. I am the God who I am. And you cannot change that. We don't live in that culture today, do we? We live in a culture of what God do you want? Make him in your own image. See the problem? He alone is holy. Always has been is today, will be throughout eternity, unchanging. We, on the other hand, are born into sin, die because of sin, and unless we find Christ along the way, that's where it ends. It's not a good conclusion. First diamond. I always got to look at George to get that. I want to call it something different. It's a baseball, it's, diamond. It's a baseball diamond, your first, first baseball diamond. Jesus is the Holy One. There is none other like him. He is perfect. He is complete. There is nothing lacking. And that's what the word perfect means. To us, when he says be perfect, he means to be grown up in, the, in, in Christ. Yes, sir. But his character is perfect in all respects. There is nothing that is not holy about him. He is complete unto himself. So for those who think everything came from nothing, you're not even doing your math right, okay? 
You can't get everything from nothing. You've got to have a cause, and he is the cause. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. It is his universe. Everything about everything we know is about him and nothing else. Therefore, God does not need us, and yet he chooses to love us. We do not complete him. He is complete in and of himself. He completes us, not the other way around. God doesn't need the church to do work in order to get it done, and if we don't do the work, it doesn't get done. If we don't do it, he will choose other means to get it done. He will always complete what he set out to do. He will never fail. He will never fall. All respects. Listen to some of the words that we, even as believers, use when talking about God. It's as though we're talking about somebody who's equal to us. Is Jesus my friend? Yes, but is he a friend like my other friends? Of course not. He's a perfect friend. He's the only one who truly knows me. Let's do, that's right. Let's do some subs under the sub. I don't know what to call these, a, a balloon, a dot? What do you want to call it, George? we got baseball diamonds. Okay, it's a circle. We'll go with a circle. Your first circle under your first diamond. He is holy deity. He is, Jesus is in fact God. Now this is my story and I'm going to stick to it. If Beck has a different version, listen to mine, okay? In her upbringing as she came to Christ, she began to realize Jesus is God. Well, I thought he was the son of God. Yeah, but that's an identifier. He is God himself. He is full and complete God. He's not just an appendage. He's not just an extra you know, sidekick or something like that. Not at all. Jesus is full God 100%. He is represented and he names himself as the Holy One of Israel. Now don't mistake Israel for political geographic Israel or you have made a big mistake. Israel is those who are the children of Abraham by promise because the promise was made to the seed, not as to many seeds, but as to one seed, the seed is Christ, Galatians 3.16. All who come to Christ are the seed of Abraham not those who are Jewish in the flesh, those who are not circumcised of the flesh, but circumcised of the heart. That's the Israel of God. It's his body. It's his church. It's his people. He is the Holy One over his holy people. Did you catch that? Don't confuse the two, okay? Because they're not the same. God himself in the flesh lives within his Israel the true Israel of God, the Jerusalem as a city coming down from heaven, adorned as a bride. That's us. It's a figure of speech, and yet it's a reality. Okay? Don't confuse the two. Let's describe him as the holy deity. He is a God without fault. 1 Peter 2, 22 and 23, Jesus is the who there. Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. What would it be saying about us? We who sin all the time, we who have all kinds of hidden agendas and guile in our mouth, we make up stuff if there's not enough trouble. When we're reviled, we tend to hit back. We tend to lash back out. When we suffer, we cry and we whine and we do all sorts of stuff. Not God in the flesh. He was the perfect man as well. That's the next piece we're going to look at, the second circle. Not only is he holy deity, he is holy man. Therefore, he is free from original sin. There is no sin in him, never was any sin. He was free from that because even though he chose an earthly mother, the Spirit of God was the Father. Without sin, his, as a man, his doctrine, his teaching was pure. It was holy. Jesus never had a hidden agenda. Jesus was never doing side deals like, anybody not do that a little bit? 
we call it rationalizing. We take something that's not right and we tweak it around until we turn it into it's acceptable. Jesus never did that. He always was faithful and true in all that he taught, all that he walked, everything. He was completely free from sin, his doctrine pure, his doctrine holy, his works were holy. There was never any ulterior motive whatsoever. Everything he did was as a holy, righteous man and holy God deity. The third piece is this, as the holy one of Israel. He's the holy mediator. What is the mediator? He's the one who goes between holy God and sinful man. This is why this is so important. We understand the incarnation of Christ, that he who knew no sin became our sin. He didn't just carry my sin. He became my sin. One more piece. On the cross, and this is huge, all of the wrath of God against all sin was poured out on Jesus. Therefore, the wrath of God cannot be poured out on his people. It's already been satisfied. Then why do we keep thinking we're guilty and we got to even the score and all this other stuff? Why do we keep trying to be good before a holy God? Even our righteousness is as filthy rags, says Isaiah. He's the holy mediator, and as the mediator, he is the cause of our holiness. He declares us to be holy because of his blood, because of his sacrifice. We dealt with that in our 9 o'clock study up here, that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice lamb of God, the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. He is the solution to our problem, and he is the complete solution to our problem. We don't have to keep tweaking it. You ever feel like you're doing that? Uh, got to push God along here. Got to help him along a little bit. No. God does not wait for me to get things right. He does not wait for me to love him. He does not wait for me to find him. He does not wait for me to stop sinning. He loved us while we were yet sinners. He died for us. He causes us to be holy. He causes us to be sanctified, set apart before him. So if you're trying to be a good Christian, here's the clue one more time. Stop. Let Jesus be Jesus in you, and you will be the Christian you're supposed to be. The more you stick your hands into it, the more you mess it up. Anybody work with concrete anymore? That's one of the rules. Once you float it and skim it, walk away. Stop messing with it. You're making it weaker, not stronger but I want it to be pretty. This isn't the time to make it pretty. This is the time to go get lunch, then come back and make it pretty at the right time. All things in order. The more you mess with certain stuff, the worse you make it. Yes. Anybody find that in your life? Yes, the more you goof around with something. <laughs> yeah. I'm a goofer and a tinkerer and a fixer, and I know most of you are because I know you. And we insist on messing with stuff. That's just what we do. And God says, I'm the mediator. Get your hands off. I know what to do. I'll take care of it, okay? Let's look at John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the way. There is no alternative plan. There is no, everybody gets to heaven by a different path. Next time you hear that, just shut your ears and walk off. There is no many ways to salvation. That's the biggest lie out there the enemy counts on. He counts on us wanting salvation our way instead of God's way, so that we will not seek God's way. He says, I am the way. Not, I'll show you the way, but I am the way. I am the truth. Not, I'm just telling you the truth. Come and listen to me and you'll, you'll discover truth. He himself is truth. Now that word's interesting, and I've shared this many times before, one more time. It's not like in school where you had a true-false exam, true-false True here is not the opposite of false. True here is the opposite of reality. 
Here's what Jesus said. I am reality. Everything else is just a figment of your imagination. You're just making it up. I am what is real. Those who come to me have life. He doesn't use the word for biological life. He uses the word for the essence of life. I am the essence of life, and without me, you have no life. You have no life in and of yourself. You're the branches, I'm the vine. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You, don't, you cease to exist. So we need to know Jesus as the way, as the truth, as the essence of life. And apart from him, you don't get any of those three. The things that matter truly are the things of the spirit. The things of this world, you have to insure, repair, build, store. Anybody have a brand new car that's now 10 years old? Get my point? Live in your brand new house that's 100 years old now? New doesn't mean new. Not in eternity. So go, you know, yeah, when we get stuck on the things of this world, then we as the body of Christ get stuck on what we're doing, how we perform, what we look like, and all that. I'm glad, Stan, that we care about the place. I'm glad the weed killers finally came. Thank goodness. Our Christmas trees are dying pretty quick. But boy, that last rain. And here's the point. While we live here, we will take care of the things God has given to us as good stewards. But that's not the point. What if we had a perfect building and place and everything we wanted and the house were empty? So what? I have to get reminded of that every now and then when the grandkids are over. My only beef is not that they tear up the place, but can you please learn to sort of put it back the way it was? Sort of, kind of? But the fact is this, the stuff that you and I have doesn't mean a thing in eternity. All of it will be gone. When we stand before the Lord, the only thing we will have to present to him is that walk we've had with him. Is my faith in him or not? He will ask what we've brought to him, and some of us are going to reach in our pocket and pull out hay and stubble and offer it. Well, that ain't going to work. It's going to burn up in the fire. Here's... Here's the, uh, the unexpected. The only thing in my life that counts is what Jesus has done in my life, and he gets the glory for it, not me. If it doesn't have a big J on it, it doesn't get into heaven, or we will mess it up. Well, I can't wait to walk on the streets of gold, as Peter said, and this is a joke. I'm going to the Peter at the gates joke, not biblical, not good theologically. He asked what the guy came with, with a bag full of stuff in heaven. He said, well, this is what I brought to heaven. And it was, you know, bars of gold. Peter looked in and said, oh, bricks. Okay. It doesn't matter. Stuff that's important here doesn't matter there. I will not be married to Beck in heaven. We will both be part of the bride of Christ, married to the groom Jesus. We will be more than we are in this life because we are both found in Christ. Apart from that, she's going to shift from my wife to another sister, very loved sister. You with me? Otherwise, what are you going to do with all your exes? They don't all fit in Texas, really. So Jesus is true. He is the truth. He is true. He's true in his word. He's true in his actions. He's true in his teaching. He's true in his character. He is truth. Everything about him, everything he is, everything he does is true. And only can that be applied to Christ himself because he is truth. We're not truth. He is truth. 
So that's your next sub-point under that. That's your first circle. Jesus is truth itself. He's not a reflection of truth. He is truth. He doesn't just teach us about truth. He himself is the essence of truth. Everybody with me on that? In Revelation 19.10, John writes this, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. What's he doing? He's bowing before an angel. The angel says, I'm a fellow servant and of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Here's the important part of that verse. Worship God. The spirit, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This verse is going to tie to your next statement. This is very important. You've heard me say this again. If it hadn't clicked, I hope it will click here today. Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Next one there, Chris, please. Jesus is the truth of all of the types of the Old Testament, types, shadows, patterns, models. Some of you, we've looked at that extensively, typology in Scripture. Jesus is all the types. All of the promises pertain to him, not us. The promises we receive is because he is the one who holds the promises. All of the prophecies point to him. Wouldn't you want to be there on that road to Emmaus with those disciples when they were dismayed because their Jesus that they thought was a different kind of Jesus is gone? And he begins to start at all of the old law and prophets. And he goes through the, it must have been a long walk. And he said, that verse is about me. That verse is about me. That's, in fact, it's all about me. So if your thought of your Christian faith is, my faith is all about me and what God gives to me, you're, you're totally backwards. It's all about him and us bringing and giving everything back to him. When I give myself back to him, that is my reasonable way to serve him. That's my reasonable act of service, to give him myself back. That's what Jesus wants. He wants me. He wants all of me. I think we just sang a song kind of like that a minute ago. He is the truth of all the types. Noah was a type. Jesus fulfilled it. Moses was a type. Jesus fulfilled it. King David was a type. Jesus fulfilled it. Every type, every pattern, every model we have in the Old Covenant points to Christ. All of them. Now we can look at specific prophecies and say, what is there, stand 200 and something or other, right? Okay? There's a lot that Jesus specifically to the detail fulfills. And so we need to understand the promises are in him, about him, and ultimately for him. Well, I thought my faith was all about me. No. If you want to lose your life, I mean save your life, you've got to lose your life, right? If you want to be greatest in the kingdom of God, what do you have to do? Become the least in the kingdom of God. If you want to be first, then be last. Everything about the kingdom is the opposite of what this world teaches us. So he is the truth. Now let's look at Luke 24, verses 25 and 26. He said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. This is the road to Emmaus event. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Wow, I wish we had that recorded. We actually do. It's called the scripture. We just don't have it pointed out the way it was to those two men. That is so big. 
If you read the Bible and it's all about you, or not, you're not reading it the right way. If, if it's all about Israel today, geographic, culture, or you're not reading it the right way. It's about Christ and who he is and what he's done and who we are in him. That's what it's about. The last circle, because of who he is, he can be depended upon in every prediction and promise ever made. Here's what I wish the so-called modern-day prophets would do. Just admit they're wrong and stop, stop writing books and leave the body of Christ alone because all you're doing is confusing everything. Just, just, just stop. They will make a prediction and it's wrong and they never ever retract. They never ever apologize. They just write a new edition and sell the book again. Now if you're one of those sheep that keep buying those books, What's the old saying? You can fool me once, twice, but anyway, okay? Stop being fooled. Stop getting caught in that. Everything that Jesus says through the word of God about who he is, what he says, what he has done is exactly as it ought to be. For those who want to keep saying the Bible is full of contradictions, the only reason it has contradictions of them is they haven't studied deep enough to see the resolution is within the same page they're finding the contradiction on. Let me say that again. When you're in the mode of, well, I think the Bible might be wrong there. The Bible's not wrong. You're reading it wrong. That's what's broken, not the Scripture. We have this whole new movement among millennials right now. They're rediscovering the scriptures, but they're not found in my Bible. It's the book of Enoch. And we got to have a flat earth. And we got to have angels that built the ark. And we've got to find the real truth by reading the gospel of Judas. That's what's going on, folks. They're not being taught within the body of Christ, within congregations and families. They're finding this stuff on Facebook, YouTube, and anywhere they possibly can. Basically, it's the ignorant teaching the ignorant. Hmm. Guess what the conclusion is? Ignorance. <laughs> That's the conclusion. Okay? You can't get anywhere else. Let's look at the second piece of this. Jesus is the one that has the key of David. Let's read a verse, and then we're going to uh, take an attempt at explaining what in the world that means and how it applies. And I will get in Matthew 16, 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What shall ever you will loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Binding and loosing is not Christian magic the way it's being practiced in certain quarters today. To bind something is to forbid it. What is forbidden in heaven should be forbidden on earth. What is loosed in heaven should be loosed on earth. When we bind the law that does not serve to save but rather to condemn and point out our when we say that the law then is not something that is acceptable to make us acceptable to God, it's rather the thing that, that, that ties us up and does not free us at all. The law does not free anybody. It serves to point out how deficient we are. When the gospel comes and it is loosed into the world, all who come to the gospel are made free and forgiven. And when it's freed here on earth, that gospel will be freed in heaven because the redeemed of this world will be the redeemed in heaven. The lost who are bound in this world will be the lost in eternity to come. It has nothing to do with all this other stuff that we're binding and casting out demons and proclaiming and naming and declaring and all that. That, that is just absolute, doesn't fit in with scripture at all. But it makes us feel pretty darn powerful sometimes, right? We all get together and declare. How many times has Satan been cast out of Farmington? Uh, he just won't go because it doesn't work that way. So please don't get caught in that. If you're caught in that, I hope you can get out of it eventually in due time. Let's look at the first diamond. The key 
to the house of David points to his kingship because David was the king of Israel and to the king of Israel was given keys to the house of Israel and whoever came under the kingship of David was part of that house. And David could open the door and let you in. And if you weren't part of the house, David could lock the door and keep you out. Again, I pointed out, David is a type of king that Christ would become, king of kings, lord of lords. He has this key of David, but he also has given to us the keys of the kingdom, which is ultimately the gospel message and all of his teaching. Those are the keys to the kingdom. That's what lets you into the kingdom, the truth of scripture, the declaration of the gospel. How shall they believe? They must hear. And how can they hear? Someone has to be sent to declare. That's how. So let's do some subpoints under this kingship sovereignty key, okay? Did that make sense? I hope the way I described that. Jesus can open the door or shut the door. If he opens the door and you come in, nobody can prevent you from coming in because he's the one that opened the door. You cannot come to my house and tell me to kick out my guest because I invited him in. You cannot come to my house and kick out my family because they're my family. I have the keys, not you. Okay? So we're not, we're not talking literal keys, right? We're not talking that. We're talking something much, much bigger. He says, I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive evermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Wow, that's going to mean something here in a second. Let's look at it. Your first circle. Jesus, because he has the key of David, because he has the keys of, of death and hell, he is sovereign over his people. He is sovereign over the church, the Israel of God. He is in charge, not us. He has the key. We don't get copies of it, not in that, not in that way, okay? So we are not the one locking and unlocking, so to speak. The only thing that we lock and unlock is by sharing or not sharing the gospel. And the result of that is up to God's spirit and his word to, to take care of. So next time you decide that you are going to follow your plan in life, stop and say, so who is sovereign over my life? As life brings its turns and twists and changes, as it always does, we have to realize that God's in control. He's in control of ultimately whether I live or die today. He's in control whether what I do is productive or not, ultimately. He is sovereign over his people. I'm not free to make up my own plan. I'm not free to pursue my own desires and goals for my life. If I truly see God as sovereign, then my, my statement before him is, God, I am yours. Do with me whatever you will. Now, that is a risky prayer, by the way. You do with me whatever you want. I'm the clay, you're the potter. You want to make me a vessel of wrath? I can't stop you. You want to make me a vessel that contains trash? I can't stop you. You want to make me a vessel to put on the shelf and just enjoy? I can't stop you. You will make of me what you want of me as I walk in your paths and footsteps. So he is sovereign over the people, not the church. This again is just I'm not saying the other way is totally wrong. I just think that one, one approach to church is better than the other. I grew up in a church that we had business meetings every single month. And we would discuss finances every single month. And sometimes we'd look for a penny for hours. And it was exhausting. And then we decided we needed to present a budget so we would know what to do next year. So we would budget missions and evangelism and training and all of this stuff. And if we ran out of money, 
missions stopped, evangelism stopped, the program stopped, because I guess God's out of money. You with me? And we calendared everything. I still have those files back on my on some old, not floppy floppies, but the old A drive. And this church was a group of people that we had. You think you're tired now? Sometimes we did something at least 28 days out of every single month, and we were busy and exhausted all the time. We were always meeting about something, and as we met, we always voted like God is waiting for our approval, right? How about if we just vote to let God do whatever he chooses to do, and the best vote that I can do is get out of the way and let go of it? That, to me, works better. You ever tried your best to do a budget and then find out that just one unexpected can totally wipe it out? Well, that's because we're not in charge. <laughs> you ever done everything right with your health and still got sick? Well, of course, because that's not, that's not the point. Ultimately, the calendar doesn't determine what God is doing. The budget does not determine what God is doing. All of the buildings that we have does not determine what God is doing. He is always doing what he has always done, seeking and saving that which is lost. So I had this discussion with my sister and brother-in-law years ago. They were caught up in their small church with dealing with financial struggles. And I said, here's what I'm slowly learning, and I hope you're learning the same thing. People don't give to a budget. They give to a vision. And when they catch the vision, you can't stop them from giving. That's how it works. Anybody not notice we don't take up an offering? Because we have to be disciplined to honor God through our giving, through our family that we have here, that we've found. And we can't, we can't outgive God. We, it just it doesn't work that way. If Jesus has me, he has my time, he has my stuff, he has my heart. All of those are non-questions. I don't have to discuss whether we have enough. You know, here's the fact, Jared. Even if we don't have the money in the bank to pay for Passion Play next year, you know what? It's still going to happen because somewhere, somehow, God's going to supply. Now, I'd prefer that we all step up and do what we're supposed to do because I really don't like waiting until the last minute. But for us to think we're in charge of it and in control of it, we're not. Let me go on, lest I totally fall off this cliff. He has the key to knowledge. He knows his sheep. He calls them by name. He knows the affairs of my life. He knows the details of the body of Christ. Nothing is hid from him. He knows all things. He sees all things. You can't pull a fast one on God. You can't outmaneuver him. He's already there. When you get there, David described it a little differently. He said, if I die and go to the heights of heaven, you're already there. If I die and go to the depths of the earth, you're already there. Wherever I go, you are already there because he is sovereign and he has the key of knowledge. He is the one who makes everything from nothing. He is the one who creates out of nothing because he has the ability to do it. But more important than the knowledge of the stuff of this world and universe is this statement. He knows me. He knows me as one of his sheep. And he knows the affairs of my life, good, bad, and everything in between, to the last detail. He's never surprised by it. He's never shocked. He doesn't walk off and say, hey, buddy, you crossed the line today. You don't belong to me anymore. He knows his crazy sheep. He knows his compliant sheep. He knows his extrovert sheep. He knows his introverted sheep. He knows sheep who like to just do sheepy stuff. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, sheep are basically dumb, okay? okay. Did, did you get it? Okay. Yeah. He knows us. Not only does he have that knowledge of his sheep and people, let's look at the third one. He has the key of knowledge of the scripture. 
He is sovereign over his people. He is sovereign and knows all things about his sheep. He is sovereign and knows everything about the scripture. It is his revelation of himself. Scripture is the revealing of God for who he really is. So for that new movement out there that, well, the Bible is just written by a bunch of men who got together. Are you kidding? Then it would not be a coherent book, and it is. Over 40 writers, 66 books, over a couple thousand years, and it has one story that threads through the whole thing very concisely, very logically. The story actually makes sense. But if you approach it as a man-written book, as just religious people, you're, re you're, you're not reading the same Bible I'm reading. That would be any other religious book you'd pull off the shelf. Here's what Jesus had to say about the Pharisees. Remember, these are the religious leaders of the day. These are the ones who hold the scripture in their hand. This is the knowledge of God in their hand, and look what he says about it. Woe unto you, lawyers, that's the scribes, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, you hindered. Nothing worse among God's people than false teachers and false prophets who are not called of God, who don't know what they're doing, who are not feeding the sheep. There's nothing worse for God's people than to be fed garbage and trash and refuge and confusion. That's almost the norm among the body of Christ. It doesn't take a whole lot to figure out that we are basically, as God's people, pretty biblically illiterate. There's always a lack of love, and there's also a we've got it all figured out mentality. And, you know, it's basically the sad part. It's just a bunch of kindergartners playing on the playground. That's all that's going on spiritually. That's a dangerous place to be. Here's the bad part, George. It feels like it's good because you're having fun. You're out in the playground playing. You don't even know your life is being threatened because you haven't been given the keys to the knowledge of Scripture that gives you the way out of this through Christ, that presents Jesus for who he is, not who I want him to be, but who he really is. So Jesus is the one who is sovereign over his people, He's sovereign over me and my life, you and your life. He's sovereign over the scriptures. It reveals who he is for who he really is, not who we want him to be or think he is. And the next base, diamond, he alone rules and reigns. That's the first song we sang this morning. And, and that's what we mean. He reigns, not us. Well, I, I thought the Bible teaches that we're going to be kings and rule and reign with them. Yeah, that's by, that's by association. That's not by authority. That's not because we know how to do it. It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. Any judgment that comes will be the judgment according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is how people will be judged. Let me give you the answer to that. There will stand before me in that day many who will come, saying, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not heal the sick? Did we not feed the hungry? Did we not clothe the naked? Did we not visit them in prison? And I will say unto them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. He doesn't dispute any of that. Hear what is being said. Those are people that look good, that don't know Jesus. And yet they claim to have this power to cast out demons and do all the good stuff, all in the name of Jesus. And Jesus says, I don't even know who you are. You never knew me. And he will throw them out from his presence. 
Then there's another group that's going to stand there, and they're not going to say anything. They're going to stand there. That would be everybody else. Come, you, my children, into the place I've prepared for you. But when did we? When did we? When did we? And he says to us, when you did this to the least of them, you did it to me. Come to the place prepared for you. My salvation is not contingent upon my performance at all. Because that verse is very clear. The group that performed, we would think the most, was the first group. And where did they end up? They were cast out of the presence of God. What matters today in my life and your life is only one thing. Do you know Jesus and does he know you as his own? Are you his, one of his sheep or are you not? That's the essence of the Lord's Supper that we're going to do here toward the end of the service. And I'll uh, touch base on that one more time when we get there. He alone rules and reigns. History is his story. It's his agenda. He's the creator of all things and everything was created for him, not for us. We're part of the creation. We were created for him. When we ignore the Creator, we show that something is broken, and it's us. But He desires to have that relationship again, and you can only have it through Christ. So I've got a whole series of circles here. Stay with me here. I'm going to try to move it forward a little bit. Jesus opens the Scripture, which are shut to the natural man. You cannot just sit down and read the Bible and make sense of it spiritually. It's an impossibility. He opens the scriptures. They are shut. Now, what if the unbeliever reads the scripture? Can he find some benefit? Yeah, he might find some historic truth. He might find some parables and some proverbs that, that are helpful hints for living. But until the spirit confronts the sinful man, and the sinful man admits their sinfulness before a holy God, there can be no belief. There must be repentance, and that's what that means, to have a change of, of mind, change of thinking. He's holy, I'm not. He's God, I'm not. He's perfect, I'm totally broken. What am I to do? Call upon the name of the Lord, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they be saved? They have to hear. You can only hear when you are presented the good news of Christ that starts with the bad news of who we are without Christ. Everybody with me on that, I hope? Therefore, he opens the scriptures. It's not because I sit down and have all the right tools. Now, I do think it's important to have tools. And those tools are helpful. But those tools are helpful to believers, not to unbelievers as such. It is interesting to me that many who set out to disprove God as atheists, some of the world-renowned atheists, as they begin to discredit the scripture and try to prove it wrong, God by his spirit intervenes and they become believers. Wow, that's because we are not saved and born again by the will of the flesh or by any man. We are saved and born again only by the Spirit of God. That's it. The church can't make you born again. Your good intentions can't make you born again. Being a good person can't make you born again. Only the Spirit of God can cause you to be born again. You must be born of the water that's being born into this world of the womb, and you must be born of the Spirit that's accepting Christ and the good news of the gospel, and now you will be born again. That's what Jesus just wants for all of us. Second thing is, he, this is a hard one. He opens the gospel to whom he wills, and no man or devil can prevent it. How do you describe that to Peter? Peter, the gates of hell will not prevail against the gospel. Is that offensive or defensive? It's offensive. The gospel enters into the gates of hell and crashes the gates over and saves the lost. 
It's not the church hunkered up in the building and the gates are secure and now the devil can't get in. That's exactly backwards. It's that the Satan cannot prevent anyone from being saved whom God saves. He can't undo it. He simply can't undo it. What did Jesus tell his disciples? He said, the devils believe that God is God and they fear him. But you should fear God who can not only take your life, but he can do with it whatever he wants. You cannot stop him from being God. Fear God, not anything else. And that fear is a good, healthy respect of who he is and what the outcome is if I ignore him. So he opens the gospel to whom he wills. And our job is, is, is to declare it. The next piece is his job. He opens the door of the church, and I'm not talking about the building. He adds to the church daily whom he saves. We find that in Acts. Those were added to the church daily as he saves people. We don't save anybody. We just don't. If we are faithful to walk with the Lord in the gospel message and to share it upon occasion and upon living our life before the rest of this world, Jesus will do his job and he will save those which are lost. And he gives them the opportunity and they can say yes, they can say no. It's up to him. He opens the door of the church, not our program, not our building, not our activity, not any of that. Jesus will save whomever he chooses to save, and nobody can stop it apart from never hearing the gospel. So he opens the scripture. He opens the gospel. He opens the door to the church. He also opens the door to heaven. How? by his blood and righteousness. There's no other way to the Father but by him. There's no other way but by coming to the cross. There's no other way but by being washed in the blood of the Lamb. There is no other way that opens the door to heaven. There just is no other way. Over in John 10.10, 10, we tend to quote that verse a lot, and we tend to point and say, well, that's the devil, except we don't read verse 1 in chapter 10. And it basically says this, the thief comes to kill and destroy. Okay? Who's he talking about? Talking about false teachers. Go back up to verse 1. He's talking to the Pharisees. And he says, you keep trying to enter in by another way. You keep trying to lead the people that you don't have to come through the door, which is Christ, but there's another way. Keep the law. Be self-righteous. Observe the, uh, all the duties of, of the religious life. He says, no, that's the thief. The thief comes and feeds you garbage. The thief, the thief comes and teaches you wrong things. The thief comes and tells you all is well when all is not well. The thief tells you that you're good enough. I mean, I've had very few people in my life say, you know what, I'm just a dirty, stinking rat, and that's who I am. Everybody always has an excuse of why, well, I'm not a bad person. I don't beat my wife very often. No. No. No self-righteousness is good. Just isn't. He opens the door of heaven. Now let's flip the coin over because I had really truly not considered this the way that it needs to be considered. The door of heaven will also be shut by him at the last day. And when is that last day? Is it around prophetic Signs of the times? No, that. Please get out of that mindset. The last day is when the last believer enters the kingdom. And none of us knows when that day is. It's an impossibility. When God in his sovereignty and his wisdom says, 
that is the last person into the body of Christ, that will be the end. And he will shut the door to heaven and nobody else can come in. Is that not the fulfillment of the type we saw in Noah? Enter into the ark and who shut the door? God shut the door. And the people inside couldn't get out if they wanted to because God shut the door. And the people outside couldn't get in because God shut the door. When he opens the door, go through. Because there will, folks, come a day when he will shut the door of the gospel and the last person will accept Christ. And we don't know who or when or where that will take place. But when the door is shut, that's it. There is no more. No one can open it. No one can enter another way. No one can try to bargain with God. That's it. Did I fill in all your blanks? Yay. Good writing. Is Jesus the holy and true? Yes, he is. Does he have the key of David, of kingship, of sovereignty, of knowledge, of the scripture, of us? Yes, he does. That's why he presents himself that way to Philadelphia. He wants them to not get caught in the trap that one of the other church. Remember the church we looked at last week? You have a name that you are alive, but I say you're dead. To the Philadelphia church, he just says, you're fine. Here's who I am. You're loving the way you love. Here's what you need to do. If I need to tweak this, I'll do it. Basically, that's the place to be. The Church of Philadelphia that understands that he is the true one. He is the only one, the holy one of God. That he is the one who has the key of kingship, of knowledge, of his sheep, of scripture, of events, of future, Nobody changes what God is going to do. He already, it's, it's his story. It's his agenda. So right now, all of us have our little agenda going. It might be financial. It might be relational. It might be health. It might be whatever. It might be your agenda today was, thank God I got out of bed and made it here. That's, that's a <laughs> good place to be. If we understand who Christ is, he is holy, and I am not. He is true, and I am not. He has the keys. I don't, apart from the gospel message. We're given the keys of the kingdom, which is the gospel. Are we using that gospel message so that God can unlock the hearts of the lost and dying? That should be the issue for us. Or are we busy building our own kingdom? that might be more appropriate to where our, the church is today, that we're busy doing what we want to do. We're busy doing our own thing. God is always seeking to save that which is lost. God is always looking to break hearts that are filled with pride against him and think that they've got it all figured out. The greatest thing that we can do today is to recognize who he is and surrender ourselves to him. If you have not surrendered to who Christ is, that's the first thing you've got to do in your life. Is it magic? No. You have to do anything for me? No. If you don't know that you know Jesus, you probably don't. Before we get ready for the Lord's Supper, let me take what I just said and move it to the next piece. In Corinthians, we are told that as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are to examine ourselves. What does that mean? I've had people through the years come up and pull me off the side and say, you know what, I'm just not being such a good person right now in my life. I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip the Lord's Supper because I'm not worthy. Is that what he's talking about? No. Is he talking about a believer to examine and see if we are being obedient and we are being true to our faith? No. 
What are we to examine? I think it's this simple. Do you belong to Jesus? Yes. Then you're invited to the table. Do you belong to Jesus when you examine yourself? I don't know. Or no. Then you're not invited to the table. It's his table for his people. So the question you have to ask, we all do, do I belong to Jesus? If I do, the master asked me to sit down and eat with him. The invitation's open. It's not to a certain group apart from believers. So examine yourself. If you belong to him, you're invited. Now, as far as potluck, you're all invited, okay? <laughs> that, uh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna card you when you go next door and see if you belong or not, okay? Hopefully you can stay. Let's bow, let's pray. Lord Jesus, you present yourself to that church in Philadelphia as the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key of David, as the king, as the sovereign, as the one who only knows truth, only speaks truth, only does what is true, as the one who is the only, the one and only holy God, and there is none other besides you. Help us to hear the message today, what we've needed to hear, whether it's by way of encouragement, by way of reminder, by way of perhaps learning something that we had not considered before. Maybe it's something that we just need to solidify in our own heart and thought about who we are and who you are. Whatever it is that we need today, we ask you, Father, to meet those needs for the sake of Jesus and because you love us. We thank you for your sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, that you became our sin, and that because you were God, you conquered death and you conquered sin, and that by your blood we are made holy and righteous before you. We are washed clean from the stain of sin. Father, that we can come to you and we can surrender ourselves to you and realize we don't have to try so hard to live for you anymore. Just let go and allow you to be yourself in us. And the Father, we don't have to have our own agenda and our own goals because we all do. In our sinfulness, we all have things that we want to get done, things that we want to do. But the question is rather, how do those things ultimately honor you? How do those things bring glory to you? Help us to consider ourselves in our walk with you as we share in the Lord's Supper in the moments ahead. Help us to consider the invitation to give our life to you, to renew our lives to you, to walk by your Spirit, to allow you to teach us what your Word says. And you'll get all the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's close with a song and take about a five-minute break, and then we'll have the Lord's Supper together. my strength, O oh God. You are my help, O oh God. You are the one on whom I call. You are my shield, O oh God. My life I yield. And you will ever be my only know. Try one more time. You are my strength, God. You are my help, O oh God. You are the one on whom I My shield, O oh God, my life by you, O oh God, and you will ever be my own. In all. Sing, you are my shield. You are my shield, O oh God. 